to be here. For the opening remarks, um, I would like to um, give the floor to a co-organizer of the event, Ambassador Benno Lagner. He is the permanent representative of Switzerland to the IAEA and the CTBTO. And after uh, his remarks, I will say a little bit about how we are going to proceed during this session. But please, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Ingeborg. Excellencies, colleagues, welcome to this side event. Let me first also thank the co-organizer, Unidia Andre, for partnering with us in organizing this uh, side event. Thank you also to all the panelists that we have, distinguished colleagues with us here today. And of course, special thanks to all of you for participating in this side event. Now, Switzerland has actively supported nuclear risk reduction initiatives for a number of years. And we have worked closely in this regard with UNIDIR, but also with other think tanks. And why have we been doing this? Well, we've been motivated to these, do this for a number of reasons. A broad body of research as part of the discourse on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of the use of nuclear weapons has increased understanding and raised awareness of nuclear risks. The deteriorating international security context has highlighted the urgency to address this issue. And while progress in other areas of the disarmament agenda has um, stalled, this is one area where we think that meaningful dialogue and progress is necessary and can be made. Now, nuclear risk reduction is not a new issue. Uh, as uh, previous review conference documents show, five of the 2010 action plan. But what we wanted to do at the last review conference was really to address this issue in a more systematic, systematic manner, to give it higher priority as part of broader disarmament efforts. And now let me make it clear that, of course, we do not see nuclear risk reduction as a substitute or a prerequisite for disarmament, but it's very much part of the broader disarmament agenda. And we also see that it could maybe facilitate um, forward movement on other parts of the disarmament agenda. At the 10th review conference, we tabled on behalf of the Stockholm Initiative a working paper entitled A Nuclear Risk Reduction Package that was also supported by a total of 30 states from all regions of the world. And it essentially had three broad areas in which recommendations were contained. Recommendations for declaratory commitments as a political signal, and I'd just like to highlight the working paper uh, was tabled in May 2021, so before the um, declaration made by the five nuclear weapon states in January 2022. A second area was recommendations for concrete actions, primarily by nuclear weapon states. And a third area was recommendations for establishing a comprehensive process to allow for follow-up work on this issue after the review conference. And among the ideas contained in the working paper was the idea to address this issue as a specific issue under cluster one in the review cycle. The review conference, of course, also saw other contributions um, from other states on the area, in the area of nuclear risk reduction. A number of good elements found their way into the draft outcome document, but unfortunately, this was not adopted. Since the review conference, risks have further increased. Preventing any use of nuclear weapons has thus become even more urgent and more important. And we also saw this week many references already been made to the issue of nuclear risk reduction in statements at the general debate. Risk reduction is also included as an important element in the Secretary General's policy brief, A New Agenda for Peace in the context of Action 1, eliminating nuclear weapons. And to quote what is written in that brief, member states must urgently reinforce the barrier against the use of nuclear weapons, end of quote. This is from the Secretary General's new agenda for peace. So it is an issue that is very topical. We think it remains a promising area to further explore, and we look forward to hearing what our panelists have to say on this issue today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and indeed, this event is meant to contribute to a discussion, uh, an informed discussion about the topic of nuclear risk reduction. We have a little over an hour. We have four excellent speakers from uh, various sectors, academia and government, that will highlight uh, uh, ongoing strains of work and also options to move this work forward. And then I hope to uh, leave 
some time, ample time for discussion with you all and hope to take as many questions as possible. Uh, but uh, bear with me if I uh, have to cut it short at some point because our time is limited. Um, we have a, a Q and A session that will take about, if we can, about half an hour, and I will ask you all to raise your hand if you want to ask a question to one of the the panelists. Um, so let me first introduce we, who we have at the table here. On my right, uh, Gauka Mukatanova. She's the director of international organizations and the non-proliferation program at the VCDMP here in Vienna. And her work is focused on multilateral regimes and institutions in nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. Then on my left, Andrei Baklitsky is a senior researcher in the WMD program at UNIDIR, where he also leads the nuclear risk reduction work stream. Further on my left, Alexandra Bell, Deputy Assistant Secretary at the Arms Control Verification and Compliance uh, Department at the US State Department. And even further on my left, Maria Antonietta Gakes, and is the, she's the coordinator for non-proliferation and disarmament at the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico City, Mexico. So we have a great panel here. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. But we will start with Gaukar uh, on nuclear risk reduction in the context of the NPT. Gaukar, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ingeborg, and thank you uh, very much to UNIDIR in Switzerland for organizing this event and for inviting me. Um, please wave if you cannot hear me. <laughs> okay. So, um, given my focus on, on multilateral institutions and NPT review process in particular, I thought I would give a bit of a background on the place of the nuclear risk reduction uh, debate in the review process, how it evolved, uh, and reflect a little bit on, on how it might go forward. Um, so from the beginning of the nuclear age, the development of international nuclear arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament architecture was very much motivated precisely by the concern uh, that nuclear weapons might be used again uh, with uh, catastrophic consequences for humanity. Uh, and the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons itself begins with the expression of that concern in the preamble along with the belief that the spread of nuclear weapons uh, increases the risk of their use and articulates the need to avert the danger of a nuclear war. Um, so in a very broad sense, the NPT itself can be seen as a nuclear risk reduction instrument with the ultimate objective of eliminating nuclear risk through the elimination of nuclear weapons themselves. However, as a specific issue, nuclear risk reduction had not been central to the NPT review process the debate for much, if not most, of the treaty's existence. Uh, one aspect of risk reduction that did receive the most attention in the NPT review process uh, in the NPT context is the operational readiness of nuclear weapons uh, systems and concern about the high alert levels that increase the likelihood of nuclear weapons use, be it uh, intentional or, or accidental. And indeed, after uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, a number of uh, non-governmental experts, especially in the United States, called attention to the persistence of uh, Cold War postures of launch on warning, launch on atta attack. They coined the, the hair trigger kind of term. Uh, and that, and that can somehow eventually fed into the multilateral discussions about high alert levels. Uh, and that uh, also resulted in the uh, adoption of language concerning operational readiness in the two, uh, 2000 final document. Uh, and particularly step nine included a commitment to implement concrete agreed measures to further reduce the operational status of nuclear weapons systems. Um, and then in 2007, a group of five states that included Switzerland um, became known as the de-alerting group. Uh, it coalesced around this concern about high alert levels and it tabled a number of resolutions at the UN First Committee and also brought their proposals on reducing the alert levels to the NPT review process in the form of working papers and, and joint statements. And here the focus again was very much uh, limited and concerning the operational readiness, to uh, con reducing operational readiness to ensure that all nuclear weapons are removed from high alert status. Now I must say that nuclear weapon states throughout this period uh, quite actively pushed against the call for de-alerting, and particularly the three Western nuclear wep uh, weapon states um, jointly opposed the resolutions in the first committee um, and arguing uh, collectively that they had sufficiently already reduced the alert levels and that this was not a priority issue for disarmament at that stage. Nonetheless, Action 5 of the 2010 NPT Action Plan, as Ambassador Lagnall already mentioned, 
uh, also made a reference to operational readiness and the nuclear risk reduction and committed nuclear weapon states to, for the first time, collectively engage with the issue of risk of nuclear weapon use uh, and, uh, and committed them to consider the legitimate interest of non-nuclear weapon states in reducing the operational readiness of nuclear weapon systems. So the language was a bit weakened compared to step nine in terms of framing it as uh, considering the interest. At the same time, it, it did make this connection to the, the P5 process, right? So, so from then on, there was a link between the nuclear weapon states uh, in, uh, informal discussions um, and, and the issue of nuclear risk reduction. However, the, the P5 did not really turn to nuclear risk reduction uh, issue in their consultations uh, for um, several years following the 2010 review conference. Furthermore, the very subject of risk reduction and especially the accidental, uh, a reduction of accidental um, risk uh, became rather charged during the subsequent review cycle uh, leading to the 2015 conference, in large part due to the, to the debates in the humanitarian initiative. So the, the, the cycle following 2010 saw the emergence, a very quick development of the humanitarian initiative that brought to the fore the focus on the consequences of nuclear weapons use. And if you think about the risk as a formula of consequences times probability, for the most part, we focus on probability, but the humanitarian initiative really brought in the consequences aspect. <clears throat> At the same time, it also revisited the, the, the issue of the probability of nuclear weapons use through the study on close calls and, and past accidents. And so that uh, really brought a more holistic um, uh, discussion and view of, of nuclear risks. But because of that link between the c discussion on nuclear risk and the humanitarian initiative, nuclear weapon states, I think, were pushing even, <coughs> even harder against that, uh, against that focus, especially at the 2015 NPT review conference. The, the debate was rather spirited, uh, where some of the nuclear weapon states even argued that there was no risk of accidental use, or at least that the risks of use were not, were not rising, as, as the humanitarian initiative insisted. So for, again, there the, the focus still remained kind of on the, the, the safety, security, the operational readiness uh, of nuclear weapons. And the shift to the uh, risk reduction discussion, and in a broader sense, the way we're looking at it now, and especially with emphasis on crisis management and prevention of, prevention of escalation, uh, occurred mostly during the last review cycle. The 10th review cycle, primarily in response to the deterioration of U.S.-Russian relations, the breakdown of bilateral nuclear arms <coughs> control, and finally, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 that really gave the, the final kind of push to, to, making, to making this um, subject front and center at the review conference. Uh, in the meantime, the P5 process also formally finally turned to the issue of nuclear risk reduction sometime after the thumbs from 2019 or so, um, but there they framed the nuclear risk reduction as strategic risk reduction, specifically sort of limiting it to the issue of emphasis the issue of uh, crisis prevention and management um, and, 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 and kind of leaving aside the, the issue of accidental use and, and these, this aspect. And so in the meantime, what we witnessed, I think, is, is the, the wealth of studies on nuclear risk reduction uh, from think tanks, uh, from, from Unidir, from uh, a, a lot of focus from states, especially Western states, I must say. Um, and, and, and the focus on crisis prevention and management, I think, resulted uh, in the conversation being a little bit divorced from the humanitarian consequences compared to the previous, previous review cycle. And that might have fed into some of the disagreements we, th we saw at the 10th review conference surrounding the issue of nuclear risk reduction. So the, in the run-up to the REFCON, a, a view emerged among many that nuclear risk reduction is both a priority because of the deteriorating security environment environment, and also the area where most progress is possible, where consensus is most possible, considering the lack of progress and opportunity on other issues in disarmament in, in, in Pillar 1. And so naturally, there was a lot of the focus on nuclear risk reduction at the conference itself. However, the prominence of this debate uh, and the number of measures suggested related to nuclear risk reduction uh, met uh, quite a bit of a pushback from uh, a number of non-nuclear weapon states, particularly those of the non-aligned. And um, I think we could have foreseen some of it, but maybe the, the, the fierceness of it was a little bit unexpected. And the non-nuclear weapon states' concern is that the focus on nuclear risk reduction 
might create an illusion of progress on pillar one on disarmament and also come at the expense of, of disarmament measures. And statements are repeated from, from different sides that nuclear risk reduction certainly does not constitute a substitute for nuclear disarmament were in and of themselves not enough to assuage those concerns. And I think part of the, the objection was the amount of time being spent on nuclear risk reduction discussion at the time that at, in the section that was allocated to disarmament. And so even though states uh, parties were able to um, negotiate a compromise language that you can see in the draft document from the REVCON, the question of the future of nuclear risk reduction discussion in the NPT remains an open question. Uh, and we heard, as, as Ambassador Lagno already said, we heard some of this in the statements today and yesterday that this, the, the view that nuclear risk reduction might come at the expense of disarmament measures and disarmament conversation is, is still very much there. So how to, how to proceed on that? Well, one aspect is, again, this framing of the nuclear risk reduction within the concern about the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapon use. I think that was one of the keys to a compromise that was achieved last year, and that will continue to be a very important aspect of, of the conversation, sort of not losing sight of the, of the bigger picture and, and the root of, of all the concerns. Uh, and another is, is this balance that, that many non-nuclear weapon states in particular strive for, that if we're going to put on the, uh, on the table nuclear risk reduction measures conversation, there ought to be real disarmament measures on the table as well. You can't have, for example, a document that restates some of the disarmament commitment that were already there for uh, a decade or two, uh, and then put a whole bunch of new things that are nuclear risk reduction. So that seems reasonable in theory. In practice, the whole reason for so much focus on nuclear risk reduction is because of the current situation where you, you really cannot agree on any real disarmament steps. So that, how to square that circle, I think, would be an, an important question for the, uh, for the NPT debates, at least in this, in this review cycle. And I know Andre will talk about some of the options in, in, in terms of taking the risk reduction forward uh, in, in other multilateral fora, but one option that I thought might be interesting for nuclear weapon states to consider is what they did in the run-up to the 1995 Review and Extension Conference and, and, and see if they in, engage what they can engage on uh, among the five on nuclear risk reduction and then issue individual statements on their nuclear risk reduction commitments that can then be recognized in, a nuclear, in the UN Security Council resolution. And that way they both commit to measures but also don't sort of take up too much time of the NPT review cycle. Um, um, so you, you both have a recognition of the importance and you have commitments on measures and you can continue working on some of the past commitments in, in the NPT review cycle meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Gaukar, also for providing us with this historical overview and situating it, the discussion firmly within the MPT, uh, and even for providing us with a suggestion <laughs> on how to move forward. I'm now looking to my left to Andre to see if he wants what he wants to add on possibilities, options for moving risk reduction forward. Uh, thank you, Ingeborg. But before I get to the the risk reduction part, I wanted to congratulate Ambassador Lagner and Doretto with Swiss National Day, which is today, and also my sympathies for having to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> this is an um, official holiday in Switzerland, they're still here working, but I hope the event will be interesting enough to, to, to compensate. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, getting back to the topic of uh, our today's discussion, uh, and Gao Har, I think, very eloquently describe what's going on in the NPT review process and I'll try to talk a little bit about other parts of international disarmament machinery which um, are involved with nuclear risk reduction but also what, what questions uh, international community has at this moment before us. And again it's it's not a new discussion, everybody here knows it's not a new discussion, Gauhar quoted the uh, NPT preamble but also if you look at the SSOD1, which again, all countries uh, endorse, it, it says um, to this end it's imperative to remove the threat of nuclear weapons, other measures designed to prevent the outbreak of nuclear war and to lessen the danger of the threat or use of nuclear weapons should be taken. And this is 1978. And actually when you read SOD1 today, it's like, wow, this is a very good text, a lot of things <laughs> to do. Uh, not much uh, has changed actually since 1978 uh, in that regard. But uh, since then we have not had much of a systematic work on nuclear 
uh, risk reduction in multilateral forum. Yes, we have uh, some of the steps in 2000 uh, uh, outcome document of the NPT review conference in 2010, as was mentioned the, in the draft final document of 2022, but not, not much uh, other than that. And the question I think we all have uh, before us at the moment is that, well, what can we do on nuclear risk reduction as an international community? Because I think there is a broad agreement that situation is not great and something has to be done, but then again, there are different views what, what should be done about this. And I think um, I will present a non-exhaustive list of things which can be done, and I think it should be considered at least. So, so the first one is just get the opinions of the countries. We know there's some strong opinions by some, but big chunk of international community is not really participating in this discussion. Um, then I think we, it would be nice to get to some kind of conclusion of what are nuclear risks and what is nuclear risk reduction. There is no definition, there's no common understanding. The broad understanding is that we're talking about prevention of nuclear war, but a lot of countries would say this is very narrow, we want added, you know, some other things. Uh, including, um, you know, unplanned detonations, and some people would say maybe including nuclear security, including other things in it. So, getting to the point of like we, we we're talking about the same thing would be would be good. Then again, um, next step would be to come to broad conclusion on what could be done, and for that, we would need some kind of multilateral discussion. Uh, and I'll get back to what options for this multilateral discussion is uh, in a moment. Then, of course, uh, as we've done with a lot of other different processes, we can look at the list of best practices, just study what have been done before, what have worked, and um, this can be then used for taking some kind of uh, decisions going forward. We can come up, again, with a list of possible nuclear risk reduction measures, just list all of them, and then countries can use them uh, if they so decide for some specific purposes. Um, those sh should not necessarily be multilateral measures. You can put a list of unilateral measures and countries can pick and choose of what they prefer, what they can afford, what they can um, think as working for them at this moment. Then, of course, uh, international community has an option to look into any possible technical issues, uh, which might arise during this um, um, process. Then, of course, there's also the option to review existing agreements, commitments, recommendations, and see how they fared. We had a number of those uh, during the years, and see how they're going would be also helpful. Then, on an even more higher level, we can come up with new structures or mechanisms, uh, if we believe, as international community, that would help us. Uh, we can make political declarations. It could be declarations of the P5, for example, uh, as we had uh, from the P5, and as Galhar proposed, uh, it can be done through UN Security Council resolution, but also you can bring maybe possibly uh, everyone to come up with some kind of political declaration. Then the, the highest level probably here would be creation of some kind of voluntary guidelines uh, where we as international community decide what is kind of good, what is bad, and all countries are invited to join. And the last one obviously would be creation of some kind of legally binding document on nuclear risk reduction. So from, from the lowest level to the highest level, th this, is, this is pretty much the spectrum. I think we can add to the spectrum, but that's pretty much what, what, what we have to do. So then to decide what of this is possible and probably starting from the lower level would be kind of the first step. If we agree what exactly do we want to get uh, from nuclear risk reduction, we actually had a very broad range of mechanisms to pursue this. And national disarmament machinery is at uh, the disposal of state parties to pursue any or all of this. Um, again, some mechanisms are better for some specific things. So once we know what we want to get, then we can use those mechanisms. So for example, uh, to do some basic uh, research on specific topics. There is, for example, UN Secretary General Advisory Board on Disarmament Matters, 
which uh, can study any topics, provide recommendations. In 2001, uh, they already had a report on specific measures that would significantly reduce the risk of nuclear war. It's been more than 20 years, so revisiting that could be uh, one of the idea. <coughs> then, of course, uh, UN Secretary General reports. Uh, there is like 200, I think, each session. Uh, General Assembly mandates Secretary General to, pro to produce reports they could be just research of the topic. It could also include asking uh, opinions of member states uh, on specific topic and compiling them. UNODA can make this. Uh, the resolution can specifically task some other entity to participate uh, in uh, this research. So again, there's a lot of flexibilities there depending on what we can get. Uh, of course, UNGA resolutions uh, are, is a huge valuable tool in this regard. Uh, there is an annual resolution reducing nuclear danger uh, by India. Um, it's very kind of narrow, I would say, and specific, but then this is something you can possibly build on. And then if you want to go to the higher level of abstraction, um, like studying specific issues, uh, list of options, and so on and so forth, there's of course groups of governmental experts, uh, which can be um, appointed by Secretary General following uh, General Assembly vote. And there are open-ended working group uh, which can negotiate specific documents, but not necessarily. For example, the first OEWG on nuclear disarmament was basically just an open discussion of how to take those things forward. And I think this, for example, would um, cut the critiques that we are taking uh, time out from NPT review process and so on and so forth. So this would be a platform where everybody can just say, like, what do you think should be done or can be done? And then, of course, Security Council action, which was mentioned by Gauhar, and um, even the summit process, uh, which has already been uh, risen by some countries. But uh, again, to remind you, uh, the Millennium Declaration, if there are people here who still remember what was that in the year 2000, said that um, including the possibility of convening an international conference to identify ways of eliminating nuclear danger. That's still, you know, on the table. It's still there. So if nation states would want to uh, convene international conference, that's, that's also an option. Uh, so all of those uh, ideas and options will be listed and discussed in more details in the upcoming Unity report on nuclear risk reduction and international disarmament machinery. So stay tuned for it. Uh, but I'll uh, leave it here and would be very happy to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, thank you as well for bringing all these suggestions and options to the table and also for reminding us of the Millennium Declaration. I was looking through the room and I didn't see a lot of recognitions <laughs> on your faces, so, so thank you for bringing that in. And we can all look it up and see what it was. Um, now let me turn to uh, our next two speakers who will bring in a different perspective, namely from government, starting with uh, Alex, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much and, and thanks for inviting me uh, to be a part of this panel. I'll, I'll start out by saying I, I am an unabashed and full-fledged believer uh, in the need for and utility of risk reduction measures. Uh, so I'll, I'll start out there, and, and I, I think, and, and the United States uh, as, as a government believes that risk reduction, in order it, for it to, to be workable, to, to have results, we need uh, what we term uh, in the US uh, in the basketball context as a full court press. Uh, so that means the whole team working together to advance the ball, as it were. So that's nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, and civil society. As you just heard, there's actually a lot uh, of good ideas and reminders that we can get from civil society uh, about how to move these things forward. Um, everyone here is aware uh, we're in a difficult security environment. Uh, the drivers of risks are increasing. Uh, you know, after decades of steady, slow, but steady progress uh, on uh, arms control and disarmament, we found ourselves back in a place uh, where nuclear threats, dangerous rhetoric uh, about nuclear use have become a part of our daily life again. Uh, emerging and disruptive technologies 
uh, threaten to further destabilize what's already an unstable security environment. Um, and shameless plug here, the U.S. is actually doing a side event on Friday about emerging disruptive technologies and their effect on M uh, the MPT. It's in room M2 at 115. Uh, in, in terms of the bilateral risk reduction space, uh, you know, we're seeing the deterioration of structures we spent the last half century building together. Uh, you know, we've seen the Russians move away uh, from the idea that no matter how bad the security environment is, we need to keep continue, uh, continuing work on nuclear strategic stability, on nuclear arms control. Uh, we've seen uh, a, an expansion of nuclear forces uh, at a rapid pace uh, from the PRC. These are problems that we need to deal with. We need to deal with collectively. Uh, we've got problems. I won't bore you uh, with all the details because I'm sure you're very aware uh, but it's imperative that we're pursuing arms control, uh, not in spite of the security environment, but because of it. Uh, and I'll just make clear that we need to use all the tools available to us in the arms control toolbox, and that includes risk reduction. It is a part of arms control measures that can help us enable disarmament. Uh, we need risk reduction to reduce the chance of conflict, uh, the risk of nuclear use, we need, to ex we need risk reduction to expand dialogue and understanding to create and maintain secure communications channels uh, in a world dis beset by uh, disinformation. Uh, risk reduction isn't a substitute for, nor a distraction from disarmament. It's an enabler of it. Uh, we all share the goal of the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. Risk reductions is one of the ways that we get there. Uh, so what does that mean in concrete terms? Uh, one, we learn from the past, reviewing what we've already done, where we've been successful, and what could work now and into the future. Uh, we have a wealth of experience, and, and our, my fellow panelists have talked a little bit about this already, uh, but we've built legally binding agreements. We've built politically binding agreements. Confidence and transparency measures, transparency and in information sharing regimes, crisis communications mechanisms. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I recommend the U.S. paper to the 2022 MPT RevCon uh, that really outlines a lot of these measures. Uh, of course, we want to be guided by the past, but we don't want to be bound to it. Uh, so what we need to also do is look at how we expand, improve, and multilateralize the efforts that we've made in the past. Uh, in our joint P5 paper for the 2022 MPT RevCon, nuclear weapon states recognized their obligation to work together to reduce the risk of nuclear conflict and identified three major elements of this work. Uh, so one, building confidence and predictability through dialogue. Two, increasing clarity, communications, and understanding. Uh, and three, building effective crisis prevention and crisis management tools. Uh, our National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, recently spoke about specific measures that can enable those three elements, uh, things like ballistic missile launch notification regimes, crisis communication channels, uh, and I think most interestingly and, and sort of more topical since everyone's talking about AI, uh, the idea of a mutual commitment to maintain a human in the loop uh, in terms of nuclear employment, something that the UK, France, and the US have already stated at the last MPT RevCon. Uh, conversations about that and, and more continue in the P5 experts level discussion uh, that we've had over the course of the last year under the U.S. chair. Our job going forward is to identify and pursue additional tools uh, that can establish expectations, enhance mutual understanding and predictability, uh, create safety nets and penalize transgressions. Uh, as the landscape uh, of threats continues to grow, uh, this work becomes even more vital. Um, it's, uh, you know, something that we need to, uh, to call upon publicly and privately, uh, the idea to take good discussions that have been having, uh, been having uh, happened on, on risk reduction and move it into specific measures. Uh, the U.S. wants to continue these risk reduction conversations uh, multilaterally and bilaterally. Uh, we will be tenacious and unrelenting uh, in the least possible threatening way, but uh, you know we will not give up on the idea that, that there's work to be done, there are things that we can agree to, they're in our mutual security interests, and we will just keep pressing. Uh, we also want to engage, as I said, with non-nuclear weapon states uh, and civil society. We're very conscious that all the good ideas are not going to come out of Washington, Moscow, Beijing, Paris, London. We need everybody. 
uh, working together on these issues. The scope and the complex nature of these threats actually demand it, require that we work together, uh, and the U.S. looks forward to doing just that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex, for your uh, energetic and, and committed uh, sp speech on this topic. Um, Tony, turning to you, uh, what should nuclear risk reduction, um, the discussion and the process include to be successful? <coughs> okay. Thank you, uh, thank you for <coughs> inviting me and for the questions. And <coughs> also, congratulations on the Swiss National Day. And, and also uh, uh, to Switzerland for all the work that they have been doing uh, since the previous review cycle to bring in th this issue uh, forward and to give it content. I, I wanted to also to thank Andre for having mentioned the SSOD1. I was not going to talk about it, but now I need to because <laughs> Uh, the conference, the, the, and also the Millennium Declaration, but um, because it has to do with what I was actually going to say, which is that um, uh, first I want to address the, the, this uh, artificial but very substantive and very uh, real and present uh, controversy or debate on whether uh, risk reduction is a substitute or a, or a or a distraction from nuclear disarmament discussion at the NPT context, okay? I, I, of course, I don't think that it is, but I think that, uh, and I cannot talk to, about, uh, on behalf of other governments or people in the room, but I think that the, the, there is a, a misunderstanding, and that's why uh, uh, the SSOD1 comes in handy. Okay, so the misunderstandings that I want to, uh, that, that to, want to mention are th at least three. Okay, so one, there is a, a sense of non-engagement um, or, no, or non-ownership of, of this issue on behalf of the non-nuclear weapon states because there is this narrative or this uh, uh, environment in the room that feels that we're talking about just um, uh, uh, the crisis management of the nuclear weapon states or the, 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 the prevention of nuclear war and uh, the measures pertain just to them. So this is, this is one part of the, of the competing narratives or contradictions or misunderstandings, okay? So that, that's one thing. Then the other thing is that we are not talking about the same thing. So one thing is a, a risk reduction measures. And then the rest of the room talks about prevention of the nuclear threat and the risks associated to the nuclear threat and that creates another divide. Uh, the, then the third, uh, the third thing that I think uh, might be might be interfering with uh, more um, productive progress on this issue is the idea that um, uh, we need to reduce the risk associated to nuclear weapons or, and the nuclear nuclear uh, war risk amongst them, uh, but. The narrative that nuclear weapons are okay as long as we don't use them or as long as they, they don't take us to war interferes with the objectives of the of the NPT and with the, the <clears throat> agreements and understandings under the NPT context that all the parties have taken into consideration. So that is why it is important to remind ourselves that this is um, uh, these are, these are uh, competing narratives, and that's maybe uh, something that we need to address more assertively during this review cycle, what we're talking about and the objectives <laughs> that we are pursuing. Um, the SSOD1 uh, uh, comes in handy because besides what Andre said <coughs> about the, the already reducing the threat, <coughs> sorry, uh, there is already, oh, there is another paragraph there that I like a lot, which is paragraph 29, if I am not mistaken, of the declaration of the SSOD1 that says that uh, while there is a special responsibility on nuclear disarmament activities by the nuclear weapon states, all the peoples in the world have a say and have a participation in, this, in these matters, and they, they should be involved. So I think that we should gather that uh, inspiration too, because uh, uh, there is ownership in the prevention of, of, um, of, of the risks. Then the other thing is uh, the conference uh, on the reduction of nuclear war. That was a Mexican proposal. We had to withdraw that proposal in 2008 eventually. But uh, the, 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 idea, the idea of the prevention of the, of the nuclear threats and the uh, rejection of the nuclear threat 
is 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 something that the MPT community has not taken on board very very clearly or very explicitly. And uh, I think that this is one of the missed uh, opportunities of the MPT uh, review conferences. Uh, and the reason why uh, we, we don't uh, embrace or, or push forward some type of uh, a rejection of the threat has to do with uh, uh, the way the treaty was born, I think, and the, the history of the negotiations of the, of the treaty that uh, assumed that uh, non-proliferation and uh, disarmament and peaceful uses did not have to do with the the, an, in, uh, 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 an annihilation or, a, or, a, or a, an addition of the already prevailing um, relationship uh, between the nuclear weapon states and, the, and their allies spe specifically. So I, I, I think that the, uh, this is the reason, one of the reasons, but that doesn't mean that we cannot embrace this issue, especially now, nowadays that we are meeting against under the looming a, a, a threats and of the of the of, of the risk of the war, but also of the pos, pos, possible consequences of nuclear of the use of nuclear weapons. So, having said that, the other the other thing I wanted to to address and highlight is something that Benno said in in his intervention, and I thank him for that. Um, the the other conflicting narrative and 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 the portrayal of the of the humanitarian initiative as a, a, another thing separated from the risk reduction a, a discussion is not productive for progress and it's not true. A, in fact, a, the, the, the so-called humanitarian initiative advocates have always said, at least my, my delegation has always said, that the a prevention of the humanitarian consequences or, or all consequences of the use of nuclear weapons is not a separate thing from the NPT or from the disarmament and non-proliferation efforts. Is the reason why the NPT has to work. It's not another thing. It's, it's not what, it's why. Uh, and if we see this issue in that regard, then uh, it, in our view, it gives content to all, a lot of packages of recommendations. Uh, why we need to reduce the risks because of the consequences of nuclear weapons. In that regard, I would like also to uh, shamelessly uh, uh, promote uh, one, pay, one working paper uh, in this review cycle, working paper 24, that I would like <coughs> or in, to invite all the delegations to read. Uh, it is presented by a group of countries, including Mexico, on measures to reduce the breadth of risks associated with nuclear weapons and the measures to avoid increasing this risk. Um, the, the paper doesn't have a very clear definition of what constitutes risk reduction, but it creates uh, the division uh, uh, less apparent and creates communicating ve vessels between this um, idea that uh, risk reduction uh, pertains only to nuclear uh, war, uh, preventing nuclear war measures, and the other uh, uh, idea that the package also has to do with the prevention of the, uh, of the, of the consequences of nuclear weapons or, or, uh, or attending to those uh, consequences of nuclear weapons. It also has um, uh, a link to transparency measures and uh, to the fulfillment and compliance with previous uh, agreements and obligations as trust and confidence building measures that also contribute to the reduction of the risk. So uh, the, the reason why I, I promote this paper is not only because my government is attached to it, but because it creates um, or it gives um, a full, a full uh, spectrum approach on all the uh, recent initiatives that have been promoted in the MPT context. So it's worth considering that uh, now that we are focusing a lot on transparency and confidence building and, and accountability uh, measures, we also uh, uh, link this to how uh, uh, non-compliance with previous obligations and commitments uh, increase the risk, how transparency measures should be in place and function in a healthy environment of decision-making processes, and that can enhance uh, the prevention of the risk. So the, the link with transparency and confidence building uh, uh, is also absent in a lot of the recommendations. But uh, this is why we need to, to have a more holistic approach to risk reduction that doesn't include only measures uh, uh, regarding um, uh, cri um, the <clears throat> crisis um, 
management or, for example, measures that can only be done by the nuclear weapon states, for example, the alerting, which is something that we advocate for and the New Agenda Coalition and a lot of our governments have a, 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 a promoted for many, many years. But that is one measure that many countries say, I cannot do the alerting myself. But if we include the, the, the pa a package of decisions that has to do with both the reduction of the of the risk, the management of the crisis, and also the attention and, and, and the, the, the measures to prevent uh, the threat and consideration to how the rest of the world uh, sees the threat. There might be a, a possibility to put forward a, 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 a commitment or a set of recommitments to already made uh, agreements in the past under the NPT context uh, to move forward a package of risk reduction me measures that include the threat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, also for telling us more about the working paper, because otherwise I would have asked you about it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we have about 20 minutes left for questions and answers, and I want to give you uh, the chance. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. I think I will take uh, a few and see how far we get, and then ask the speakers to uh, reply. I see one, two, three. Let me start with those three questions then. Please, sir, go ahead. John Hallam. Um, I'm with People for Nuclear Disarmament and a few other groups. Um, and I have been banging the drum for risk reduction for literally years and years. Um, and, I mean, Reto and um, Benno will certainly know me. Um, and, um, I mean, full marks to them for, um, for pushing the operational readiness, which also came um, out of my lobbying um, way back in 2006 or thereabouts. Um, it, it's strange to have been a voice in the wilderness for so many years and now see that risk reduction is the flavour of the month. Is it just the fact that we're now poised on the abyss, as it were, in a way that we haven't been since the Cuban Missile Crisis um, that makes this the case? And I'll leave that to anyone on the panel that wants to take a crack at answering it. Why so much attention for risk reduction now? Then, second question, please. I mean, that, that, that attention is obviously very welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Darren Hansen from uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia. Um, thanks for those uh, presentations, uh, very informative indeed. Um, and also the uh, reflections on SSOD1, uh, indeed an excellent document, and within its program of action there's also a reference to hotlines of communication, which I didn't really think was a word in 78, but there you go. Um, yeah, I certainly agree that we all have an interest in the, the concept around uh, nuclear risk reduction and that we should engage, and that's partly why you've seen Australia, for example, in, uh, in chairing the UN Disarmament Commission back in 2018, inject that into the discussions there, uh, the funding for the unity work, and also the ARF, the ASEAN Regional Forum, a uh, series of workshops that we've conducted in our region uh, to promote risk reduction there. Uh, we agree that the narrative needs to be worked on seriously, uh, that uh, we should be considering nuclear risk reduction as something that's embedded in part of a disarmament process, not um, something that's separate to it. It should be embedded just like we talk about nuclear disarmament verification. Uh, we should be talking about nuclear risk reduction as part of the disarmament process. If, if you, uh, I think the previous speaker mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, well, it was the risk reduction agreements, you know, for example, the 1971 agreement between the US and Soviets on risk reduction that triggered a lot of the arms mm -hmm. control agreements that led to an 80% reduction in stocks. So how do you separate that, uh, that process? Uh, and so I think that's all one part of the, the, the same process. So we need to embed uh, the, uh, the, the concept of risk reduction within a disarmament process. That's, I think that's very clear and history has shown us that's the case. Uh, so, and even if you put that to one side, 
uh, and, and talked about uh, risk reduction in a different way that, well, even if at this PrepCom all of the nuclear weapon states say, hey, we're going to eliminate all of our nuclear weapons uh, and we've all agreed to it, that's going to take decades uh, to achieve. Uh, and those risks will be with us mm -hmm. for those decades. And so there is another imperative to actually take risk reduction steps there. So even if you looked at it in that different concept as not part of a disarmament process. But, so there are uh, critical reasons that we need to work on, on, on the, uh, the actual uh, concept and narrative there. So I guess that's more of a comment uh, than, than anything, but uh, uh, very, very much stimulated by the, the excellent presentations. And I thank you for that. Thank you. I had a question over there. Uh, yes, yeah, so Paul Ingram from uh, the University of Cambridge. Um, <coughs> I, I'm sitting here feeling very grateful that we've had such good um, presentations on nuclear risk reduction. I think that it was it was an excellent outline. Um, I'm also sitting here feeling uh, both uh, admiration for the highlighting of the polarities uh, here uh, and sensing a, a sense of frustration. Uh, I've got it, I think you've all got it as well, which is that these polarities around, on the one hand, managing the nuclear risks, and on the other hand, eliminating the nuclear risks, is somehow uh, opposite, and it, it really isn't. It's, it's a process over time where we have to eliminate these risks, and we, in the meantime, we have to manage them. This is a theme that comes up again and again and again. And we are an international community, a global community has to manage this thing and then get rid of it. And, and, um, and I, just, I just wanted to uh, highlight this idea that nuclear deterrence is the trading in risks. You don't engage in nuclear deterrence without creating and contributing to nuclear risks. And uh, so when you're managing these nuclear risks, uh, you are managing a, a, a really difficult tension between creating them, but not too much. And so there's, there's something here around admitting that one contributes to the risk, but that the only way of getting out of it is by moving together. And all of us need to be engaged in that in the way Tony was talking about. So I, I, I guess my question, and, and, and Alex was saying the same, uh, my question is how can how can non-nuclear weapon states and civil society be more actively invited into this process by the nuclear weapon states when the nuclear weapon states are engaging in this very challenging and difficult management of creating the risks and trying to reduce them? perhaps mostly to, uh, to Alex, in, t in terms of how, do, how, how can uh, nuclear weapon states include civil society and non-nuclear weapon states in this discussion. And then the other question, I think, was, uh, was basically to all of you. So I look at you know, who would like to come in. But Alex, can you respond? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, well, I think this is one of the ways uh, interacting uh, in fora like the uh, MPT PrepCom uh, and the, you know, the clear, strong civil society uh, contingent that's here. Uh, and I will make another shameless plug for another event that's happening Friday, and that's the Young Professionals Network that we've set up as nuclear weapon states where we have uh, young academics and scholars from all five of our countries actually uh, participating in a conversation about uh, both nuclear doctrines and risk reduction. And uh, so they've done some really interesting work and so heavily commend that one too. I don't have the room number, but we'll, we'll make sure to get around a flyer. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think there's some conversations that need to be had among the five. Uh, I think the conversations we've been able to have uh, in spite of the security conditions over the course of the last year have been very good. And I think they've been very good because they have been a, a closed conversation where, where there is a comfort level uh, with the conversation that it won't be you know, sort of uh, used by any particular state uh, for political purposes on the outside. We've been able to keep it a, a, a good and civil and constructive conversation. We'd like to continue that. Uh, in terms of the, the question about flavor of the month, um, I, I think Darren uh, made the point uh, very uh, correctly that there was a lot of risk reduction work at the beginning of the U.S.-Soviet process. Uh, we got really good, we and, we and the Russians, to eventually make a lot of 
arms control agreements that were, you know, verifiable bilateral reductions, and, and people got used to that. But but risk reduction was always a part of the effort, and, and I think why you're seeing it now is because you've got to use the tools that fit the circumstances. And right now, the circumstances are not ones that necessarily enable us to be sitting at a table talking about deep reductions. We're in a bad place. But that doesn't mean that we can't do anything, and what we're doing is is risk reduction because that's the tool that fits the moment, uh, with the hope that we will, you know, get back to a place where we're having those deep level discussions. But there's also uh, work that needs to be done to develop that. We and the Russians have spent 50 years working on on these issues. It's still difficult, as everyone can see. Uh, you know, we're not there yet uh, with Beijing. There's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in that context, and it will take us a while to build to the level uh, of the kind of treaties people kind of got used to and maybe even took for granted that it was something easy to do. They're quite hard, and, and the bad news is we've done the easy part. Coming from really high stockpiles to lower ones was the easy part. The lower the numbers go, the better the verification has to be, uh, the, the more draconian the measures have to be to make sure that each side has trust in them. Uh, that takes a while to develop, and again, that's why it's so important to have a, a, a broad-based discussion with non-nuclear weapon states, with civil society, helping us think through the solutions of, of how we can actually get to these next steps. So that Tony also wanted to comment. Um, I, I wanted to comment uh, something on what has been said about recognizing deterrence as uh, one of the risk makers, but um, I, I, I want to, to, to see it from another angle, which is I always have sustained that one of the best uh, counterpoints to deterrence are nuclear weapon free zones. Um, and, and nuclear weapon free zones are hardly ever regarded as a risk reduction measure. And his, historically, they have proved to be a contribution to peace and security as a risk reduction measure. So uh, the fact that 116 countries uh, in the world have taken this uh, voluntary and sovereign decision to not contribute to the risk of, of, uh, or not to pose a risk to the nuclear weapon states, not contributing to the risk of acquiring and possessing and using nuclear weapons for their security, has to be highlighted in the in this uh, process of uh, in this package of, of of risk reduction measures to be reinforced and to be uh, highlighted as a counterpoint for other doctrines and uh, respectfully we 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 understand that some states um, use nuclear weapons for their security we know why that is we cannot justify that because at the same time we have 116 countries doing exactly the opposite and, uh, and historically, historically proving that uh, they have contributed to lower, lowering the risk in the regions. At least that's what happened in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you. Andre, and, uh, sorry, I, I had uh, Ben first on my right and then Andre. Yes, please. Thank you. Well, how to bring non-nuclear weapon states into the discussion or into this discourse a very practical measure is to include nuclear risk reduction in the reporting by nuclear weapon states uh, and then to have these reports discussed with non-nuclear non -nuclear weapon states and you will see in the different proposals that have been made what kind of items should be included in reports starting with the draft final document of 2015 but also what we have containing the working paper by New Zealand, Ireland and Switzerland or, or in the working paper that Tony referred to um, you will see that measures to reduce risks is one of the items mentioned to be included in reporting by nuclear weapon states. So that's an opportunity also for the dialogue between nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. And of course, if you would also include civil society representatives in such a session, you could also then bring them into the discussion as well. Maybe just quickly to react to what John, John said, why? I think uh, Gauka uh, laid it out very nicely the humanitarian consequences discussion, the studies, I mean, the Chatham House study, for example, also mentioned the working paper that um, Tony referred to, and then just the current situation. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you look at the newspapers or listen to the news and you hear threats being made of the possible use of nuclear weapons, I think it's not very far then to go and see why nuclear risk reduction has become such an issue. Thank you, Andre. 
Uh, everybody's uh, commenting on uh, Tony's, well, Mexico's and other countries' paper, so I would also <laughs> mention it's a, a really good paper. Um, please have a look if you haven't. And I was really surprised by this coalition of countries which signed it. So yeah, uh, we, we might want to talk with you because I would love to know how this uh, came came about. But answering to the um, John's question, um, I would say that it was a curve. Uh, on this because during the Cold War there was a lot of discussion of uh, nuclear risks. There was uh, in 1982 Secretary General's report on preventing of nuclear war. Uh, in 1981 declaration of UNGA on prevention of nuclear uh, catastrophe. In From 78 to uh, 1984 there was annual resolution on non-use of nuclear weapons prevention of nuclear war. And then after the Cold War ended in 1994 there was, uh, you know, huge um, sweeping UNGA resolution specifically on prevention of nuclear war, which, you know, it was recommending for a conference on disarmament to negotiate a treaty on preventing nuclear war and so on and so forth. But then as the 90s progressed, I think there was less and less interest because nuclear war wasn't something which people were thinking about. It was something of the past. And then I think it was uh, as the relations between the major power, nuclear power were getting worse and worse. It was like people starting to again, watch the news and say like, yeah, this is not going in the right direction. We should maybe do something about it. Go, Gar. Yes. Just to pick up on exactly where, where uh, Andre was, it, it seems like there was basically a shift from uh, at first concerned about a nuclear war, specifically between uh, US and USSR, to then a period of lull and a period of concern about accidental use. And then now we're back to the concern about a nuclear war. And so the nuclear weapon states pr seem to primarily fall in their interest on the prevention of nuclear war and not so much on the accidental use. And that's where the nu non-nuclear weapon states are situated. So yes, of course we're concerned about nuclear war, but even if there isn't a, a threat of nuclear war immediately now, we are still concerned about the existence of nuclear weapons that can be used um, even accidentally or as a, result of, as a result of some kind of miscalculation. Um, and, and, and a little bit on what Paul said about the frustration at perceived polarity between eliminating risk and managing risk. And I think here in the NPT context, this is a, 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 a problem of trust. Non-nuclear weapon states that are concerned that nuclear, nuclear risk reduction the conversation is going to take over the disarmament discussion. They come from the, from the place of mistrust, right? They don't believe that there is good faith um, behind the discussion of nuclear risk reduction and more of an attempt to sort of just normalize the existence of nuclear weapons. Um, and on the other hand, nuclear weapon states, um, they don't want to discuss, to, to, to get engaged in the broader discussion of, of reducing nuclear risks because that's an attack on nuclear deterrence and that's kind of at the heart of the, the security policies. And so I think that's the kind of where we would need to, to have um, the effort to bridge those divides and agree that both discussions have to take place and we just, we just really need to start somewhere with an understanding and share understanding that, that of the, the goal where we are, we are going and not down in the 50 years but in the kind of very foreseeable future. Thank you. Uh, approaching almost uh, the end of this discussion, I think we, we might have time to squeeze in one very concise question to one of the speakers if there's an urgent need. Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. My name is Petra Seibert. I'm an academic here in Vienna and member of the DPNW Scientific Advisory Group. And I'm wondering whether under the heading of risk reduction, um, deep cuts to the arsenals of the United States and uh, Russia would also be discussed considering that uh, certain classes of uh, risk uh, would uh, be proportional just to the number of nuclear weapons existing on the planet. Thanks. Whoever wants to answer. Thank you. I'm also I'm, I'm tending to look at my left. <laughs> so, Alex, please. I, uh, yeah, uh, please feel free to jump in, any uh, my coworkers, but I, our colleagues. Um, uh, the U.S. has been clear, uh, and, and uh, as I mentioned, our national security advisor just gave some remarks at the, at the beginning of June talking about uh, 
uh, our willingness to engage the Russian Federation uh, in a discussion uh, of strategic stability and arms control without preconditions. It doesn't mean without accountability. We want to have conversations about uh, their uh, purported uh, illegal suspension of New START, and we want to fix that agreement because we think it's in our interest and their interest and the global interest. Uh, but our, our principles uh, and objectives haven't changed. Uh, you know, even in spite uh, of their uh, further illegal uh, invasion of Ukraine and, and the, uh, you know, subsequent war, um, we want to have a conversation about the entire Russian strategic arsenal. Uh, we want to have a conversation about the, the new and novel weapons that are being built to make sure they're not outside of a loophole uh, controlling intercontinental uh, range systems. We want to talk about non-deployed systems. We want to talk about tactical or theater range. Uh, nuclear systems, and that means we're willing to talk about uh, our stockpiles. There's an expectation uh, that we build past uh, New START that, that will expire no matter what uh, in February 2026. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's in our obligation and, and our commitment to the MPT that we will continue that conversation, continue to push to continue that conversation. Uh, again, uh, we think it's a conversation, you know, we think it's a an activity, uh, an undertaking that's in our interest, in Russia's interest, and in the interests of the globe. So we uh, encourage all MPT states parties uh, and encourage civil society to continue the pressure uh, to, to push Moscow back uh, to the table to talk about these really important issues. Thank you. In that regard, I think we also welcome the fact that the P5 is still talking about these topics. And you are soon handing over the chairmanship, I think, to the coordinatorship of the P5 to Russia. So we're also watching with great interest, I think, what, what will happen uh, next. Um, coming to the end of our session, I'd just like to ask, is there anything, panelists, that you want to say as final words, some takeaways? Yes, Tony, please. Yes. Um, Last year, we almost agreed on an outcome document under the MPT framework that uh, contained uh, some um, <clears throat> package of um, commitment to the risk reduction measures, but they were prefaced by, by saying that these are not um, ends in themselves, that they, these, these are interim measures pending the total elimination of nuclear weapons. So this is a, this is a phrase that sounds like a, like a mantra for, for a lot of delegations, but it means that we are still um, uh, considering our previous agreements and obligations that the goal of the MPT is, is, is to eliminate nuclear weapons and uh, uh, all uh, actions and all uh, new commitments and new actions should uh, aim to, to that, should not be taken as a different path or as a justification for the existence of nuclear weapons. So I wanted to remind that, not because we are saying that, but be because the, the success of any uh, work or, or any work or any uh, future discussion on this issue depends on that, depends on framing this correctly as an interim measure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much to all of our speakers for their excellent contributions. Before closing this panel, though, I would like to give the floor to Andre for a few concluding remarks. Yeah, I don't want to take too much time from your busy schedules, so I just want to conclude with a gratitude to our colleagues from the Swiss Department of Foreign Affairs, Red Wallenmann, Ambassador Ben Lagner, for um, you know supporting us and to all of the states who support nuclear risk reduction work stream, apart from Switzerland, it's Finland and uh, Norway. Uh, thank you, of course. And of course, to my colleagues at Unidir, Shizuka and Sarah Rus, who worked really well and hard to, to, to get this event done. And with this, I return the floor to Ingeborg. Thank you, everybody. Again. In addition to, um, to thanking the panelists and the co-organizers of this session, I also want to thank you, uh, audience, for uh, being here in great numbers and for contributing actively to the discussion. I invite you to explore Unity's website also uh, to see the work that they are doing on nuclear risk production. And with that, I thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you all. Thank you.